PCN is brought to you in part by the following underwriters. Hello, I'm Maureen Boyle here with Julie Thompson. Tonight on PAC TV Community News, we take you inside the award-winning Panther TV and PNN at Plymouth South and North High School. The fully refurbished pipe organ returns to the First Parish Church in Duxbury, and we meet back up with the Plymouth Craft as they pass on the ancient skills of woodworking. The First Parish Church in Kingston turns 300, and PCN stop by to hear the celebration plans. And we have a brand new State House report with State Senator Vinnie DiMacito. Mike Gamaris is back on set with a brand new Home Matters, but we start tonight's show with a kick. The Kingston Police Department hosts a women's self-defense class at the town's recreation center and always has a strong turnout for women looking to better prepare themselves in the event of danger. We spoke with one of the instructors to find out about what the class entails and to learn a little bit about the instructor himself. Ready! No! Yeah. Forward strike on ready, five of them. Ready! No. Tonight we're putting on a defense class for women. Uh, Kingston Police Department's putting that on. Um, our main goal really is to put the power into the female's hands and teach them some defensive moves um, just to avoid some situations that are out there. A position opened up and then uh, I requested to do I thought it'd be, it'd be great. When I was in the Marine Corps, uh, I took combatives and so, took self-defense in that. So I felt that I had a role from learning on a military side of self-defense and how can I transfer that over to a civilian side and then also how can I transfer that over to civilians to teach, you know, teach self-defense moves and that. So I was pretty interested in it when it came out. Um, my role really here is to instruct, um, to teach these defensive moves, to teach these things to look out for, these um, dangerous situations, and then walk each person through the steps of uh, facilitating a move, how to uh, properly perform it, and then uh, we, we go through like actually like pr practical application with punching bags and, and defending. If you look at the, the roles, uh, a lot of times what we teach in the classes, females are, are sometimes thought that you know, if there's a situation they can't defend themselves because they don't know how to defend themselves. So what this class is set up to do is to put those tools into the girls' hands to be able to identify a threat and if that threat is apparent it's there, um, defend themselves. In this class it's really dynamic. Usually what we do is we teach uh, high schoolers this class. It's usually senior girls. Uh, right now we have an open forum so we're opening up. I think we have a 16-year-old girl all the way up to a 64-year-old uh, woman. So. You can see the class is pretty diverse, and what we're doing is we're, we're taking that stereotype away that women are, can be defenseless, they don't know these moves, and we're putting the power into their hands uh, with these defensive moves that we're teaching them. It's really kind of like a walk or crawl, walk, run stage where we start off teaching them just certain stances. We go into punching, we go into using your voice as yelling, and then all the way towards the end we'll be doing scenarios where someone will be dressed up in a suit just, um, and basically breaking down like a fight. A fight will break out and a female will have to defend herself in uh, that fight. We're really trying to change uh, people's mindset. So a lot of times we're, we're giving uh, experiences through people that have been in the military, uh, people that are, that are police officers, uh, and also people that have gone through this course. So teaching those skills to people that you know, go through their day-to-day, -day not really identifying threats. Now a lot of times people come back in the class and be like, oh wow, like I saw this and you know, it kind of made the hairs on my neck stand up. And kind of it change, we're trying to change people's perspective of uh, things that are out there. Students at both Plymouth North and South have been putting forth some serious effort when it comes to their in-house news programs, PNN and Panther TV. Each year, students at both schools produce about 10 half-hour shows that are held to exceptionally high production standards. Well, their hard work has paid off and the long list of awards proves it. PCN's Walter Cicchetti stopped in to learn more about why these programs are so successful. In addition to working on essays and homework, students in both Plymouth High School broadcast journalism programs also work on several TV shows each year. 
PNN began in 2009 when Michelle Terry was looking to incorporate a broadcast journalism component to a print journalism class for high school seniors. It started as announcements with one camera and evolved from there. Obviously, they learn video editing and interview skills, as well as aspects of journalism and the technical. But I think the biggest thing kids get from this is confidence. Um, I have a lot of students who tell me they have never picked up a phone and called someone they didn't know. I think this class causes them to get out of their comfort zone, and they're very proud and confident and become more prepared because they can talk to strangers and they can talk to people with various different backgrounds um, in a professional way. Kyle Peroni says so far the class has been challenging but fun. Through this class within a couple of months I've learned so much honestly, um, especially from my friends. A bunch of editing skills. I really had never edited anything before. The last segment I did last week, and uh, it's just a great experience. Panther TV, launched in 2009, mirrors the program established at North and allows both juniors and seniors to learn about broadcast journalism. We have expectations that would be expected of someone working in a starter market. Um, you know, somewhere, you know, maybe small market television where students are learning all aspects of it. They're writing, they're producing, they're anchoring, they're editing their own stories, they're their own photographer. You know, it's really to give them a well-rounded experience of what it means to be in broadcast journalism. It's great to see when the students down the road, you know, are recognized for their work. Um, you know, are named one of the best in New England or are receiving regional um, high school achievement awards. And the best thing for me is that the, the class is like a family. The kids really work hard together and it's not all about the individual, it's really about the team. This is Carrie Marino's second year in the class. She says the class has helped her decide to pursue broadcast journalism in college. My favorite part about Panther TV is being with a lot of people that enjoy doing the same thing that I'm doing. Um, whether it's anchoring or helping each other write scripts or being a floor director being on monitor or anything like that, it's always a good time and we're always like a little family. And it's one of the best classes that I have and I look forward to coming here every single, every other day. <laughs> Combined, the programs have been awarded first place 110 times over the past eight years. Last year, both programs tied for best high school TV news program from the New England Scholastic Press Association we can only hope both high schools continue to succeed moving forward. Reporting for PCN, I'm Walter Chiquetti. takes a look at the demolition of the old high school and finds out that tearing down the old is Well, Julia, it looks like we have a little competition. Yeah, <laughs> both high schools. Wow, that is so impressive. And what's great is these kids are learning the full aspect of making um, a television news production. They talked about sometimes they're on working on the script, sometimes they're on camera, sometimes they're on monitor, sometimes they're in the control room. And people don't realize until they've done this how much goes into a newscast. So we're really proud of them. Yeah. Keep up the good work. Yeah. At the First Parish Church in Duxbury, the 164-year-old organ has returned from its year-long restoration project. PCN stopped in to find out what's new and improved, and we meet the man responsible for overseeing this complex endeavor. It wasn't a miraculous moment. I just more and more became attached to the instrument and the sound that it created. So it, it was a, a undeniably a, a wonderful instrument and, I mean, and I've enjoyed it for all these many, many years. How unique is this organ? Are there any others like it in the area? Right in our, our immediate neighborhood, no. So many have been replaced or expanded beyond recognition. The sad thing about uh, many of these instruments and, and it's partly what motivated me to uh, see this, see through this restoration process before I retire. The same company, the Andover Organ Company, has maintained the instrument. The, these folks are, are particularly expert at dealing with the instruments of this vintage. And they spent about three or four days at least getting all the parts in, getting the, the outer shell up in place. And then the next week, they brought a little less than half the pipes back, and they've been slowly putting those in and carefully uh, voicing them pipe by pipe uh, to make sure they all speak uh, 
compatibly with their neighbors in this new acoustic, because it it's, sounds different here than it did in the shop. We had to make adjustments to, to the architecture of the loft, but that was very, very carefully and thoughtfully done. All uh, the pews had to be altered to make room for a larger footprint. The organ was about 10 feet wide when it left here. It has come back 16 feet, four inches wide. So we altered the, the, the pew structure, but we kept intact all the original wood and just slid it back a little bit. Everything you look at all about the instrument is, is still the original woodwork. So all the historical features of the woodwork up here in the loft have been maintained. It looks just the way uh, Simmons would have done it if he had been asked to build a larger instrument um, back in 1853. So, so it represents him well. And for one instrument to do what it does, it, it has so many different voices. Uh, so many different colors, and uh, from from soft to you know overpowering uh, in in an acoustic like this, that it uh, it it allows uh, the playing of music from you know four or five centuries, and uh, it's not just the the grand impact, but uh, a lot of delicate voicing within. If you if you are centered in this space spiritually, and your mind and heart are open, it can move you. Craft held a workshop on teaching the ancient art of log splitting. We often take for granted that we used to mill lumber by hand, but Plymouth Craft is keeping these historical skills alive. PCN stopped in to get the story. This is one of Plymouth Craft's standard workshops where we teach the ancient craft of splitting a log apart instead of sawing apart into boards. So we're using wedges, hatchets, and an old tool called a fro to learn how to read the grain in this log and split it open to get usable stock out of it. So this is a, a very old way of harvesting the usable material from a log. This sort of uh, craft, and a lot of the crafts we teach here at Plymouth Craft, whether it's textiles, uh, cooking, the woodworking, uh, ironwork, these are all sort of a, a connection people can find to uh, natural materials and also to handwork. So the benefits that I see are that they're engaging their hands, engaging their minds in uh, working with these natural materials in old ways that are new to them. For me, I teach lots of workshops both here and in other woodworking schools around the country. And for me, the exciting part of it is maybe twofold or more. One is the connections I make with other people, with all these students from all walks of life, quite far flung. We had a participant here from Australia this spring. Uh, so those connections to people and then the excitement that I get in sharing my love for these traditional crafts and finding that sort of fire lit in other people. This is just a, a part of a woodworking career I have that spans back almost 40 years now, uh, where uh, others have taught me these skills using the ha hand tools, non-electric tools, so uh, old tools, uh, old style tools. I've had a chance to, to use some tools that I don't always get to use, or some tools that I purchased and I didn't always have a chance to use. So uh, uh, yeah, we started splitting oak logs with wedges and sledgehammers, and then uh, basically took these enormous logs and split them down into uh, smaller bite-sized pieces so we can make some lumber out of them. I have experiences with woodworking, um, always had a passion for it. Um, a few years ago, quite a few years ago, I saw PBS with Peter Follinsby and some of the other folks, um, I had to try that, you know. So what happened was uh, last year I took a class here at Plymouth Craft and uh, it just keeps spiraling. So this is my third time here in Plymouth and I've taken some other classes with Peter in the past as well. I, I'm glad that these folks are doing what they're doing for us. Uh, it gives me a chance, I'm relatively local, where I can come and do something with my hands, step away from the uh, electronic world for a while and, and, uh, and get back to some roots.
there is a church in the town of Kingston that's even older than the town itself. When the Kingston First Parish was established in 1717, it was actually located in an area still known as Plymouth. The town basically built itself around this church, and we spoke with the interim minister about the upcoming 300-year celebration. The church was founded in 1717 by a group of families who had settled in Plymouth but were now living in this, the, this area north of Plymouth, and it became called the North Parish and also, the, I believe, the Jones River Parish. Um, and they petitioned the general court to have their own church and their own community because the, it was too far for them to walk to Plymouth every Sunday. Unitarian Universalism has a history of being very inclusive, inclusive and very socially conscious. We were the first congregation, first um, denomination to ordain women, to uh, support suffrage, to, uh, there were a lot of the early abolitionists were Unitarians, um, we, and, and have, there's a lot of support for the LGBT community. It's a great congregation. Lots of families are coming and people who have been members of the church for some 40 and 50 years, some of them, who are still here. We've got some families who were among uh, some of the original settlers of the town, that their descendants are still involved uh, here in this congregation. On November 19th, uh, Sunday the 19th at 2 p.m., the congregation will have a big service and reception that's part of this celebration for their 300th anniversary. They've been doing some different programs all throughout the year, um, but this will be the culminating event that honors the anniversary. Will the proclamation that founded the church will be read? And so it, the, there'll be some political folks here uh, as well. It, it, and it's a big deal for the congregation and the community because this, the, the town of Kingston itself grew out of this church. Senator DiMacito speaks with PCN about a new committee he's been appointed to that explores the impact of digital retail on brick and mortar retail institutions. We stopped into his district office to hear more on this. Just recently, I was appointed by the minority leader to co-chair a special subcommittee uh, that was through the Senate that addresses the issue of retail. Uh, as many people are seeing, uh, more and more shops are closing. We're just, uh, you know, just got a conversation. We had uh, supermarkets closing down here in Manomet. Benny's is closing. Macy's is closing stores. We're seeing even the big Walmarts and the big boxes starting to, to shrink back all because of Amazon and the change the way people are getting their you know, goods and services. There's a, a more of a comfort level with buying stuff online, using your credit card online, and so more and more people are doing that. And it's having a real impact. So the goal of this special commission is to have a conversation about what can we do? Do we just sit back and let this industry that, that employs one out of every five people in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts just dry up or do we start talking about it and say maybe there are things that we can do better and we're going to try to do that we're going to start in on Cape Cod very very uh, big in retail and a lot of mom, small mom and pops uh, in January then we're going to go to Western Massachusetts uh, we're going to have conversations with people in Western Massachusetts and then we're going to go to Mer uh, the Merrimack Valley area which abuts New Hampshire. Our hope is by the end of June have some kind of report written to what we learned as we traveled around and what we see as best practices um, for other places that have dealt with this. There are different areas that have dealt with this earlier than we've dealt with it and so what did they do and how did they do it more effectively. So that's our, our, um, 
our hope is to put something together. We're also going to be having conversations with experts that have studied, studied this from an academic level. So they're going to come before the commission and they're going to tell us about what they've learned, what people's, you know, there's a psychology behind a lot of this and what, we, what should we be doing in, in trying to educate our retail industry about how to do retail in the 21st century as well. And then, and then of course, are there things that we can do legislatively? We are so pleased to welcome back on set Mike Gamaris, who is the owner broker of Remax Spectrum here in Plymouth, the South Shore and beyond. Welcome back, Mike. Okay, thank you very much. It's we have you quite frequently for your section that we call Home Matters, mm -hmm. and you talked all about real estate. We're gonna start with what we always start with, the state of the market right now. It's getting to be near Thanksgiving. Things are slowing down. Hard to believe the holidays are here. Unbelievable. Yeah, we're, we're always talking about how we think that the market's gonna come to a screeching halt. And um, this year, it's, it's actually not done that. Uh, it started to slow down in the last week or so uh, mm -hmm. with the weather turning cold. Uh, we, we did benefit from some great interest rates. Uh, they dropped in the past couple weeks, yeah. which kept people in the game a little bit longer. Um, but as expected, going into the end of the year, it's going to it's going to slow down. People are going to focus on family as they should, and then rev up uh, in January. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think uh, folks are still feeling pretty good uh, about the economy in general and mm -hmm. where things are going. And there's not much uh, concern, I think, right now about the tax program that's been uh, presented as in discussion. The uh, home mortgage interest, whether or not it's still going yeah. to be used as a, as a deduction, it's, that's that's up in the air. Of, of every everyone's um, tax uh, sure. planning each year sure and uh, putting a cap on that is it could be devastating so yeah uh, the National Association of Realtors is, is definitely fighting that uh, on behalf of homeowners and I think that we'll, we'll and see all that the homeowners are fighting that too yeah absolutely yeah. We'll, we'll see that stay I think okay uh, well let's hope so so let's talk about how we prepare our homes for the winter uh, starting with water what, yeah. What's the big deal about water? Water is probably the, the, the toughest thing that homes deal with uh, because any penetration of water in the home can create havoc. Um, homes are built of wood mm -hmm. and water does not play well with wood. No. Um, so there's a lot of things that people can do in, in preparation for the winter. Um, whether or not they're going to sell in the spring, uh, mm -hmm. they should be doing these things anyways just to preserve their home. Mm -hmm. uh, but you want to do everything you can to keep water outside the home. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it really starts with you know, simple things that can take maybe a couple hours on the weekend um, to prepare and, mm -hmm. and get ready for the winter time. So it's like shutting off your uh, water spigots, remove exterior hoses. If you have an internal shut off in your basement for the outside, you should shut that off. Yeah, some of the newer homes, uh, so you have your exterior spigots, you want to shut them down, you want to remove the hoses from them. Yes. Any water built up in there is going to freeze. Freeze, right. Yep, and cold air can travel through that uh, frozen water into the home. Um, newer homes have shut offs inside the home. Yep. So sometimes in the basement, you'll see a, a shut off inside. Mm -hmm. It's even better to, to shut off inside, keep the outside open at that point, mm -hmm. and let it just drain. Okay. Um, and then you'll have no no concerns. Uh, one of the misconceptions people think is that the um, the spigots are, are you know freeze proof. Yeah. But they're, they're really not. not. Yeah, they're not. Okay, great advice. Uh, clean the gutters, downspouts. Yes, yeah, probably the most dreadful job. And people uh, forget about that. They do, you know, and I think uh, people don't realize they they think maybe there's not a lot of trees around their home, so they can't have a lot of leaves or pine needles in the gutters. But, they but do. wind blows and, and and it does make its way in there. Any buildup in your gutters, um, if those downspouts are blocked, the water can build back up and, right. and penetrate the trim boards and in the roof. Yeah. Um, and then you'll have water stains in the home. And you it, go and back to that water again, creates, that evil creates water. Lots of problems. Yeah. So you want to take some time just to make sure the downspouts are clear. Um, extend the downspouts over the lawn if you have yeah. if you have to to get them away from the house. Okay, perfect. Remove screens. Um I never do that. I know. I never did either until uh, the last few years. Um, there's always something that's blowing in the wind yes. uh, in the yeah. winter time yeah. and, and can hit a screen. Um, even heavy buildup of snow yeah. inside the window yep. area can uh, put stress on the screens. They yeah. can rip, tear, uh, and then in the summertime you have bugs getting in and whatnot. So uh, very simple. It takes a few minutes for each window to pull them down. Right. If you have storm windows, make sure those are back up and, and operating well. Yep. And that's a really good time to check your windows to make sure none of the glass is broken. Yeah. It, really good point. Excellent point. Um, store all exterior furniture. Yeah. Yeah, those those uh, lawn chairs is the worst thing in the winter time. I've seen a lawn chair flying through the uh, the yard. Uh, it can it can do a lot of things. Uh, it can t break through a window, yep. through a door. Yep. Uh, just do damage to siding, which yep. you don't want as well. Um, so it's good to pack up all that stuff. Not up. everybody has a shed or a basement, mm -hmm. um, but if you can pack them tightly somewhere in your yard, uh, up near a ho yep. your home, uh, around a deck, yeah. so that the wind can't really get right. at it. Even put a tarp around. over them. Anything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It really does go a long way. Um, your heating system tune-up and your tank check. 
Yeah, the heating system should be done every year if it's an yeah. oil system. Mm -hmm. And most times uh, people like to do it in October if you mm -hmm. can, but when it's warm out like it's been, people kind of forget. We forget it. Yep. Yeah. So it's good to check your um, oil tank, make sure there's no leaks. Yep. Have someone service your oil system. Um, mm -hmm. The last thing you want is any kind of uh, what's called a blowback or something mm -hmm. that's going to cause carbon monoxide to, to build up in your home. Right. Um, so it's, it's money well spent. And if you maintain it, it runs more efficient. It actually saves you money in the long run. Exactly. Uh, what about the smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors? Yeah. So we we get spoiled with summertime windows are open, yep. air is flowing. Um, we always try to change our batteries at the, the yes. clock changes, yep. of course, right? Yep. But um, when the house is all tight up, tightened up and the windows and doors are closed and the heating system is running, that's the time where there's a risk for carbon monoxide. You want to make sure those batteries are changed. And mm -hmm. I would also say that uh, if your smoke detectors are seven years old or older, mm -hmm. you probably should think about changing them. Getting they have one. internal yep. batteries now yep. and they fail after about seven yep. years. So yep. it's good to just change them out. Perfect. Um, tips for uh, winter efficiency aside from that anything else to yeah I think um, you know everyone's caught up in the nest thermostats and things like yeah. that programmable um, oh, it's yeah, good and where bad. It'll, it'll turn back on at, eight, at five o'clock because it knows you're coming home at six absolutely but that's a constant up and down of your it's a strain on your heating system yeah if you yeah. set your, your temperature and forget it uh, your system typically runs more efficient yeah. it'll keep a constant temperature it's not going to always feel that really heavy load right I know that everyone feels differently about that but there are really good uh, studies that show that the, the systems last longer if they're kept under um, a constant temperature rather okay. than up and down. Yep, really good advice. So in our last two minutes, let's talk about um, preparing your, your home for the spring. Mm -hmm. Because not many people, unless they have to, would intentionally put their house on the market probably in December or January, right, right. unless they have to move for a, a work reason or something else. Sure. So the idea would be, March, right? End of March? Yeah, you want to always beat the market. Uh, okay. So you want to beat that inventory flux that comes in generally in April when people are thinking of spring. Yep. The challenge we've had in the last couple of years is we've had snow on the ground uh, first week right. in April. Right. Um, so that's been hard for some yep. folks to get to that. But you definitely want to get on the market before that. So if you're targeting end of March, mm -hmm. You're, you want to get a month or a month and a half prior to that to start thinking about mm -hmm. what do I need to do to tidy up my home, get it ready, start opening up what I closed down yep. uh, for the winter time, make sure I don't have any repairs that are needed. Yep. You want to give yourself some time. Nothing worse than starting to get the house ready and mm -hmm. find out you have this big repair that needs to be done mm -hmm. and that's going to set you back a month. Now should you, should you um, figure out what realtor you want and bring them in for a consult a month, six weeks before you actually want to put it on the Absolutely. market? Absolutely, yeah. You should always interview several realtors, have them come yep. and give their opinion on your home, Yep. Uh, let you know some of the things that need to be touched up or looked at before you put it on the market. Yep. And then that way you can start to get to it um, and hire them to uh, to hit the market running before April 1st. Right. Uh, you, you really want to focus on prior to that date. Once you get into April, you're competing with more homes. Right. And that's going to hurt your, your right. saleability. The less homes out there, the, the better, better yours your looks. Price. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And how homes are still selling, though, the ones that are out there are still selling quite quickly. They are. Yeah, homes that are priced properly are selling uh, very quickly still. Yep. You know, we're seeing homes go under our agreement a week or two still, um, which is very good. Yeah. Homes that typically linger longer than that have been overpriced right. and right. they need to they need to react to that right. and get their price. Because every home. house will sell if it's priced. There's correctly. a buyer for every home. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And the, and uh, and for the people that are um, not thinking of selling their house, what advice do you give to if they see that their their neighbors are selling their house? Is there anything th to do with the neighborhood? Yeah, I mean the neighborhoods are neighborhoods are very important uh, in how people maintain their home yeah. throughout your entire neighborhood. Yes. Um, and and quite honestly, uh, human nature, uh, people take care of their homes. It tends to be infectious throughout yeah, the neighborhood. Yeah, it's true. So if you're yeah. out doing things in your yard and you're showing you, you're, you're tidying up your property, even though you may not be selling, yep. it definitely helps yep, other people does. get in that mindset. Yep. yep. Excellent. Great advice. Great. Thank you. Thanks. We'll have you r back right after the first of the year. Can't wait. To chat about the, the new year and the new market. Let's get ready for 18. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. And thank you for watching. If you want to see the show again, you can check it out our website, and PCN is also on YouTube. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook to get up-to-date info. PCN will be taking a break for the Thanksgiving holiday, so be sure to tune in to PAC-TV programming to catch America's hometown Thanksgiving parade. See you in two weeks, and have a wonderful holiday.